Hi, good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before we go on to the conference, just to like to mention the fact that we have another tremendous raffle. Uh, thanks to everybody who's donated the prizes. Uh, please support the raffle because it goes towards the cost of the refreshments that we'll have later in the afternoon. So our first guest speaker today, as you can see, is Dougal MacDougall. Boats, trains and horses. Now I can understand the horses, plenty book for the garden. And I can understand the trains because there's a hell of a lot of train spotters out there. I won't call them anoraks, but the train spotters. But where the boats come in, the CB. who knows? But well, let's find out. Dougal MacDougall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll not say I was invited, I was volunteered to do this at all by a friend who will name, who will name the name. Still a friend. Still a friend. I need him. So, the title of the talk is Boats, Trains and Horses. The boat you see is a fishing boat, obviously, um, called a ring mater. Or nowadays it's dual purpose. Um, they don't make them like that anymore, unfortunately. The part of the horse you see is a Shetland pony, but I'm not talking about him. But he happened to be in the picture. And the train is a tornado, which was, I think, the first new build since British Rail got rid of the Darlington. Yes. Tracy, we're getting excited now. Well, <laughs> Tracy, Tracy knows more about it than me, so I'm not saying very much about them. But what I'm going to do is primarily talk about the fishing and the type of fishing and a couple of trips that uh, the horse made. So let's see if we can get it to work. Yeah. We're not moving on. Technical, technical hitch, obviously. That's mm -hmm. the wrong one. Wrong way. You press it right button. Press on the right button. <laughs> right. Way back at the time, or before the 20th century began, I come from a place called Tarbert in Lochfine. And this is fishing boats of that era leaving the harbour and going to fish. And they're going to fish for herring. <coughs> Mostly they were sail and oar. Um, and they fished all over the west coast of Scotland, <coughs> primarily in Argyll, primarily in the Firth of Clyde, and further up the loch, turned left there in that picture, and up the loch to as far as Inverary, where at one time it was suggested that in front of one of the hotels there, you could put a bucket over the side of the boat and bucket herring without putting an eight out. So that was then. Um, about the turn of the century. And that's what they sailed in laterally at the beginning of the century. Um, the boat was about 30 feet long, and the previous picture, all the boats were open, no decking at all. This one you can see there is a bit of well, there is a bit of decking forward which um, provided some shelter for the crews in the various places that we went. The wee boat that you see, the punt that you see, has the net, and they're obviously going to take the net aboard the boat before they go out. And you see another boat lying against the pier, lying against the quay. A very arduous way of life. There's three or four men on each boat, and, and again, there's the oar. That's them going out. And that was about 1890, 1900. They, at that time, set their nets, they, they drift net, they shot a boat, a net, and it's just straight line, and the fish went into the net. They had no means of seeing, no electronic means of seeing where the fish were. So what they had to do was use their experience. Their experience um, consisted of looking for things like gannets in the summertime, seagulls, Gannets, you would see them diving, and uh, depending on the depth of dive, depending on the type of fish. Herring, 
are fished for usually at night. So these boats would be going out in the evening, maybe 7, 8 o'clock in the summertime. We'd go wherever they were going to go, look for a few, what they called appearances, which were gulls, gannets, herring have a, a swim bladder which puts bubbles up to the surface. So they call that spouting or spouting. And if you were lying at the bow of the boat or even over the side, you could see the bubbles coming up. So that was a sign that they were herring. They also left an oily sheen on the water. So that was something else that was seen. And some people said they could smell them. And one of the books that I have, there is an article in it that somebody was smelling them. There was nothing else to be seen. And they did shoot an egg and they got some here. Not a lot, but they got some here. So these boats were drifting. And around this time, or before it, the people, the ring netters from Tarva, the fishermen from Tarva, they decided that the drift net was not an efficient way of fishing. So they then shot the net, kept it one side of it on the boat and made a circle with the other side and brought it together, eventually like a purse. One on the right there is about 1930. Now you see they progressed quite a lot from the second picture. You've got a wheelhouse, you've got a mast for probably a radio, and the radio would be a short wave radio, um, and the deck is completely covered. There's a fish hole, <coughs> and there's accommodation for the crew, and there's obviously an engine now. 1950, this, this boat here was launched about 1950. It was lost um, off the island of Mull about eight years later, maybe earlier. Um, my mother had money in that boat. Uh, and the guy who owned it and skippered it stayed with us. It would carry around six or eight hundred baskets of herring, which is about 15 tonne of herring. <clears throat> now, that might sound a lot, but I don't know whether you, you see on the TV a lot of these trawling programs. And I saw one about six months ago where the, the target for the week's fishing, and this was a week, um, was a thousand tons of mackerel. Yeah. They got a thousand tons of mackerel, they were taking them to Norway for onward shipment if they were okay to go to Japan. So on the way to Norway, we saw a big spot of mackerel. So they had a go at it and got another 300 tons. So they were landing 1,300 tons. Now these boats, full, landed about 15 tons. Um, it's just, that's why there are no fish in the sea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that, that's over I mean, that, it's just over, totally overfishing. That's why this method of fishing is no longer used, because they're totally overfished. This other boat here was built in 1965 68 at a cost of something like 20,000 pounds. It doesn't seem to be a lot of money in today's terms, but it was then. Um, that first boat was built on that boat yard, and that was the boat yard in Target. There's another story of one of these built in Girvan, cost £20,000, um, built for private owners. The boat yard had money in it, and the fish buyers had money in it. Paid off in three years. That's how much money was involved. My brother worked in this boat, and he told me a couple of weeks ago about the kind of money he was earning. In 1953, he was on it in 1953, and he caught one, two weeks, he caught large numbers of herring. Three or four boats were filled. £100 a man in 1953. Now, that's still a lot of money, even today. But there was a lot of money. There was a, these, boats, these boats went all over the, the coast 
to fish primarily on the west coast. <coughs> I think it's you. Yeah. Must be. Well, it. No. No, you. That's what. Definitely me. I don't know what you've done. No. It'd be my fault, wouldn't it? No doubt. Really? <coughs> that might be it. That might be the problem. <coughs> no, 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 it stops. I have a spear. Spare one. Spear. Any idea, Andrew? No, it's as if the computer's frozen, isn't it? Can you end the slideshow? Yeah. In the meantime, these, these uh, fishing boats, they, all the places on the west coast of Scotland, primarily I'm thinking about the River Clyde and Walk Fine, they fished, the, the fishing vessels, the, there were a number of boats, there were fishing boats in Ayr, the Newer, Maidens and Ballantry. And they um, fished all over the, the, the ocean, the west coast. They also went to the Isle of Man in early summer, and they also went to Whitby in sea houses. And again, and, uh, I spoke, <coughs> spoke with a fisherman who had been in Whitby. The first time he went to Whitby, he told me it was the first time he saw a hundred pound note. <laughs> so he walked around foot the all we came with this hundred pound note in his pocket along with his hand because he was dead scared that he would lose it. So I mean that was just a game up in the fifties. Yeah. <clears throat> that that was about, that was about nineteen forty eight and you see that's that's terrible. And you see the number of fishing boats that are there. Come on, back, please! They worked, they worked in pairs, um, and that was just a picture that, as I say, showed the number of <coughs> boats. These are modern boats now. The one on the left is the one which was on the beach. That's her neighbour, who was built about three or four years later. There is a YouTube video on part of her being built. That's her back in landing fish. And this here is a graveyard. And this is on the other side of Tarbot. This is on the other, this is on the west of Tarbot. Tarbot's built in an isthmus or something. Um, there's a west lock, this is a west lock, and they're on the east lock. Uh, this boat here, along with another two, were just abandoned. Mm -hmm. Engines taken out of them and just abandoned. Um, that's the area where they fished. Ayrshire boats, Isle of Arran, so they fished around here, up into Loch Fyne. They went through the, in the winter time, they went through the Crenn Canal there, and they fished up around these areas, around the islands. They fished in the lochs around the islands. They didn't go any further, they didn't go up as far as Stornoway, because in the early part of the 20th century, the people in Stornoway didn't like them beginning to use what they called the ring net, because they all used drift nets. And they reckoned that the ring nets were going to kill everything. And didn't. Someone else did. That's what they're after. Herring. That's what they become. Kippers. <laughs> and these are what fine kippers. They still actually um, 
there is a Kipling place still in Tarna, but you don't get that hearing from a fine anymore. <coughs> that was the middle of the 20th century, and these were gutters. And what happened was they gutted the herring mm. and then salted them, gutted them, put them in barrels and the biggest part of the market was to the bold. Now these were all women, there were very few men, it was all women. And there was groups of women who went around the country following the fish, following mm. the herring. Yeah. Um, I, I, I remember, I just remember them in the fifties. Um, along, not, not there, but along the shore um, in the <coughs> front street in Tarva and nightmare. I absolutely must have been off with her fingers and her hands with the salt and just and the knife. Cuts must have been horrendous. They, they, they had bandages around all the fingers, but they still obviously had problems. Now, this, this gentleman was part of a project uh, run by the Clyde Fishermen's Association and it was called Casting the Net. And this, if you get this video to work and listen. This will be okay. <laughs> right, it needs another touch because the first part of it is not good. <coughs> if this works. What, he, what he's going to do is explain what happened. He's not. I don't think he he's is. A, he's a retired fishing skipper and owner um, from Carradine. I don't think he is. There you go. That's an eight inch show. You have to tell us what he said. We'll disregard, we'll disregard the other one here. I'll talk Sorry. What, what the other video was, he was showing, when they shot the net, like here, at the, end, at the end of the net, along here, there's a wee light. Um, there's a, a, something that will float. And there's a wee... There's a wee... Oh, no, there's a wee... There's something that will float. There's a wee light in the end of it. So the net is short. The boat travels, it shoots in the air, travels in a half circle. The other boat, the neighbour boat, catches the end, they haul the net, they just run the net for maybe five, ten minutes, twenty minutes, and then the two boats come together. Mm. The end of the net is transferred to the boat that originally shot the net, and half of the crew, or four or five of the crew, there's five crew there, they would all go on to the other boat and they would then all haul the net. Now, the only mechanised part of the job was a winch, two wee caps and barrels, and the lower part of the net, or the sole, was hauled in by caps and by the winch, because that's where the weights were, where the lead, lead ball, lead rollings around the net. That's where the weight went to us. So they, they were hauled in and the ends were hauled in. Back to last minute. Right. The net was hauled in. The ends were the cord. The big ball that you saw in the picture where the man was putting the net out. There were five balls and each ball signified what part of the net it was. The ends of the net, the meshes, the matches were big white matches. The next part they were smaller and the middle part they were very small so the herring couldn't escape. And by that time the bottom of the net was up so they had what was like a purse. So the, net, the only way the herring would escape, these nets were made of cotton, so the only way the herring would escape would be the weight of herring in the net would burst them. Mm. So this picture here, this, this guy who owned the boat that was sunk, he's got a basket or a half basket of herring which he's taken to the market so that you can see the size of the herring, the quality of the herring, and that would suggest how much money they would pay. 
that's that's a living for us. Now, can you imagine living with six guys? The only five there because the Robinson went up in the wheelhouse. Can you imagine living with six guys for a week at a time, for a fortnight at a time, in these conditions? Drinking tea, tea made with condensed milk, or the milk content of it was condensed milk. Absolutely horrendous. That's why I don't drink tea. <laughs> So that's kind of the end of the fishing. Lots of money was made at the fishing. Um, there was a hundred pound escapades. Regularly at home we heard of big shots of herring and crews were getting a hundred pound a month. In 1968 I asked my pal who was at the fishing. I said to him one day, how did you go on this week? Uh, we had a poor week. I was working in a bank and I was getting in my hand five or a week. <laughs> that was nineteen sixty eight. This guy a poor week for him was twenty pounds. Then we'd go we go on the Saturday night and we spend the five. <laughs> and they were only sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> this is the other boat that we saw regularly in Tarba and in other places around the West Coast. Designed primarily for transporting goods obviously. In this instance it's coal. Um, and they were also designed that they could lie on the shore because they had a flat water. And it's cold it's here, and you can see, this was on the Isle of Arran, and you can see the transport that's taken the coal away. Now, there were three or four men in these boats. When they were discharging the coal, they discharged the coal into well done. They discharged the coal into big buckets. Now, you can see the bucket there. Two men filled that. 100 tonnes in the, in the vessel. And again, that's an iron. That's the top of iron there. That's one of Graham's books. It's a submarine in for Brandon Sound. Oh, right. it's, yeah. a bit, it's a bit elongated, but yeah. I don't know when the picture was taken or who took the picture, but that's, that's what that is. Whoever, the last seagoing pilot steam. Yeah. Um, needing some work from a I think putting the new engine, <coughs> engines into it. <coughs> QV2. Oh, it's on. I, spent, I spent a day in Hellsborough taking pictures of the QV2. That was the best one I could take, I could find. But lots of the other pictures had the, the red arrows in it because they were flying around because this was her saying cheerio to the client when she was built. Yeah. I had drinks on her last in October. She's birthed in Dubai now. Right. You say, is she still okay? Yeah. Clive Belter. Yeah. Right, that's kind of the end of the fishing bit. Um, the, bit of, the bit with the trains is really about engines, it's not about trains per se. Um, I've travelled a few miles, shall we say, chasing trains, chasing engines, primarily down in this neck of the woods and over in, mm -hmm. in Yorkshire. That one, I'm not sure where that one was taken. I thought it was taken in Cree, Cree and Larrick in Scotland. But the headboard there says uh, Cotton Mills Express. So I make an assumption that it was in Yorkshire somewhere. I don't remember uh, being Chase. I don't remember Chase. And Tracy, Black Five? That's on A scale in the settlement in Lyle Line. Um, normally people take their pictures above here. And when I started going chasing these things, I was amazed at the number of people who were there. And you can see the number of cars there are. There's a lot of sad people in the world. But the saddest ones, I think, had step ladders. They <laughs> <laughs> had step ladders. So that they could Come get away. high and see. Um, yeah. Right. I was quite amazed. Um, I spent a lot of time here. And that, that engine is working quite well. That's on Sharp, and that's the Duchess of Sutherland. And it's on a tour of Britain. It's one of the engines that's used in a tour of Britain. There's a company who, for the last 10 years, 15 years or so, have organised a round Britain tour using steam engines. And they go all over the place. 
Uh, this one was going to Sharksville, and I made an assumption that it was maybe going to Edinburgh, uh, but I didn't follow it to Edinburgh. Uh, and the thing, the thing for me, the, the reason I think why I chased them is because I like the noise. I like to see something that we've made, and people have made, uh, that turns water yeah. into power. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's my job. Yeah. And there's also, as you see, the uh, smell. smell. Yeah. But it's noise. Yeah. That's Ribblehead Viaduct, and that's um, the Union of South Africa, uh, owned by a farmer who has now taken it off the rails. I think it's just left East Bury, has it? No, no, it's still in Bury. So it's still there. Well, I've never been, I've never been to Bury. That's on my pending file, but. It's never a... Uh, well, you need to go. We've got a Battle of Britain class coming through shortly. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I, haven't, I haven't chased trains for you. I haven't got time, Bill. <laughs> and that's uh, Princess Elizabeth taking water at Appleby. They rebuilt the water tower at Appleby a number of years ago because that's a favourite so stopping place for them. I visited Barrow Hill well, a number of years ago, um, there was a, a, an exhibition of uh, engines. I had a difficult, I had difficult <coughs> time. I stayed at my daughter's in New York and then went to Barrow. So I had a good time there. And on the other side of where all these sad people are, there's another shed and it was full of diesels. Which nobody was interested in. <laughs> now, these are just some of the pictures that I've taken. Um, that that is a black five, and there was something special about that. Um, it's a one off thing because of the mechanical workings of it. Picture here again is of the scale. That's the scale, and as I say, you can see there are a lot of sad people around the wall. Um, it's another, just another picture. We missed the last one, but it's just angels. This thing here is a diamond. I have a book, or I have a video that says diamonds wear forever. And this was the hallmark or the trademark of the North British Railway Society, North British Railway Company that built um, about 20,000 brokers and sent them all over the world. Unfortunately, when dieselization arrived, they built some diesels, but the engines of it in them were rubbish and they lost their way. This Royal Scot here is in Glasgow Central Station, and I followed this train from Sharp to Glasgow. <laughs> no idea the miles. I, I had a car that was about 10 years old and was. 250,000 miles on the clock, mostly spent chasing trains and horses. The picture below here is two engines in Oban. They came from, I think from Fort William. There were two engines that were on the West Highland Line and on the Jacobite train, which runs for six or eight months from going to Mali in the summertime. And this one here is a finishing crane in Glasgow. And the finishing crane transported, lifted these engines and put them on the ships that were taking them to wherever they were going. What you see here is an engine made of straw. There was a guy, I don't know what it was, but there was obviously some kind of commemoration so what he was doing was commemorating the fact that the crane was used for that purpose. But now it stands at Finiston. It stands where the SECC is and the Hydro, where all the pop are. The parking course, unfortunately. These are John Cameron's two engines, and that's a video, um, which makes a lot of noise. They were again part of the Great Britain tour and they were heading for the MMS. And that was, they were going up to Albany, which is to the Slogs, which is the highest part of the Slogs. Mm -hmm. This is 
is the Duchess of Salem heading up the beta. Yeah, I was following the books that you can make on screen and flip to the time. Um, lots of noise. Again, it's a video which isn't going to work. These were found in the <coughs> National Railway Museum in New York. Now you can take out the hand of the light, but I was at cremation a couple of weeks ago. I was at a burial um, the same week, and it was ashes that were buried in the burial. So my take on that was that you should only be putting the engine ashes on the, on the ground. And I liked that. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. I was listening, on the way down the road today, I was listening to um, a guy called Eric Bogle, who's a folk singer who emigrated from Peebles to Australia, and he was talking about, he was singing about something, and one of the comments was, the dress went north and the Greeks went south. <laughs> <laughs> so that may be connected, I'm not sure. Now that's what you call true love. This is General George and my wife Sheila. And I have maintained for the last 25 years that we've had him, that I hope I die before he does. <laughs> there'll, be enough, there'll be enough water to float a fishing boat. <laughs> now, George has bought us a rising five-year-old. Um, Sheila, Sheila um, had ridden before. She'd got a pal in the island of Arran. She'd lived in the island of Arran for a long time. She's got a pal there with her. A horse. Oh, with a horse, literally. So she did a bit of riding there. So when she bought a house and she had a flat in Oldham and she was working there, obviously. So she had a pal who bought a horse. So Sheila went to the local riding school and was riding out one of the horses. So what happens often with the riding schools and the liveries, uh, they don't want to keep their horses in the winter because it costs them money because you have, to, you have to keep them. So they sometimes just give them to people for six months and then get them back. So Sheila had this uh, Highland pony called the Electric, who was anything but. However, he's, he was in her pal's uh, farm and he got a bit fed up, so he went back to the other. So that was the end of that. But Sheila spied this guy in the livery and she eventually got him. She got a broken ankle with him. She bucked her off when she was trying to ride him one day. However, he's done something like 7,000 kilometres in competition, and he's probably done twice that in training and everything, everything else. So she bought this horse to hack out, you know, just getting his back, go for a wee ride somewhere, come back, put him back in the field. And that was fine. She did that for a few a few times, and then she had this pal who had a livery, another livery, and she had a big horse who did um, what they call endurance riding. So endurance riding is you get in a horse and you ride 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, 40 miles, 50 miles, and you do it all in one day, you know. So she joined the endurance club, and she started off, so you start off with pleasure rides, so a pleasure ride is 10 miles. You do it in a, an allowed time. It's an allowed time for the, the 10 miles. So that was not a problem. She did that. She did that for a while. And I'm thinking, now oh, that's nice. I'm chasing trains at this point. <laughs> Can't you avoid that? So, <clears throat> having joined this club, and having done pleasure rides, getting a bit fed up, because it's only 10 miles. So. There is a grading system that you can grade your horse and it goes from bronze to silver to gold to platinum. And I think there's another one after platinum, diamond. We're never going to reach the platinum or the diamond. So bronze is 30 miles, in the one day. Silver is 40 miles in the one day. And gold is 50 miles in the one day. Now to do the bronze, you have to do so many rides up and then, so many rides and then up to 20 miles and then you get the 30 miles, you do the 30 miles. So we did that. We did that 
then we went to silver, and we did the silver. And then we went to gold, so we did the gold. Now that was against gold. Part of the crew, I was, by this time I was a crew, so you couldn't go anywhere. A horse couldn't go anywhere without a crew. Because you have to cool the horse down during the ride, and then you have to cool the horse down at the end of the ride. So you have to, you start off, you go to the vet, you go to the farrier to check that the feet are okay, you go to the vet to check that his heart rate is okay, his bowel sounds are okay, and his mucous membranes in his mouth are fine. Now, to start a ride, the heart rate has to be below 48. To finish most rides, the heart rate has to be 48 below. George is a big horse. Um, the horses that he rides with, I was told it was just up and down. Yeah, well. I'm still We're struggling again. So there's no video this time. Standard. <coughs> He's a lovely big horse. He's a lovely nature. He's a frosted. He's done a right? huge amount of work with him. Yeah. Um, but we have a horse. When we got him, we got a companion horse, an old mare, who died when she was 38. He was five when we got him, and he's now 31. Mm. But we got this old mare. So every time we went away, the mare was left in the field. Mm. Yeah. I heard animals. Oh, so oh, oh. I heard animals, so you have to have yes. a companion. Oh, that's right. yeah. So we had a companion, but then the companion was left on its own. So we had to have a companion for the companion. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up with two companions. Um, so it was a pair left in the away. Because we went away often for the weekend. Um, and often not for the weekend. There you go. Right. Can we move on? Right. Um, the pictures you see are Sheila sitting in the left hand picture here. She's sitting having done half half a mile, half mileage. Um, and you can see some of the stuff that's required for the horse and for the rider. Here we have a blue bucket. That contains water for him to drink out of. Here we have a five gallon container which contains the water that he'll drink out of and also the water that will go over him. Um, we've got the saddle sitting there and we've got the rider sitting there. And this is what we call a bed pole. Where you're, if you're doing 30 miles, you have to get a rest of 15. And you see the vet, you, you come in, you get the horse's heart rate down to 48, you go and present to the vet, and then the horse gets 20 minutes, depending on how long you get, you get half an hour. So then the rider has a rest, the rider gets some sustenance, usually a banana, and a drink, and then we set it off again. So this is George here, doing his first 30 mile that was in the borders, um, and he didn't pass the vet because he was stiff at the end of the, the vetting. Principally because we were inexperienced and we let him stand without moving. Um, obviously, just stand and don't move. Uh, but we need to keep him moving so that he uh, is supple. Sheila here is trying to blow up the air mattress of the tent. Now, we weren't usually in a, a ground tent because we had a trailer tent, which was um, good because it kept you off the ground. You had your cooker and everything else. So I don't think that was very <coughs> successful. My memory of that was we kept falling off. And here's George in his glory um, running along the railway line in Fort William. Still going again? Not doing anything. Sorry. <coughs> Must be my video. 
Mm -hmm. the, the, next, the next lot of pictures, mm -hmm. um, as well as going to see the vet uh, to get him to listen to your heart rate and everything else, you have to call the levels up so that the vet can see that it's fit to go. <coughs> so you have to run into the horse, trot the horse for about 90 feet, 30 yards, bam. He looks at his back end as he's going away, as you're going away from him, and then you turn the horse and he comes back and he looks at his front end. And you then decide if the horse is fit or otherwise. And you then get ready to go. Right. So I usually did the job. The picture you see with the shield doing it was very unusual. Usually I did the job. The IT stuff these days. Probably the, probably the input is rubbish. It will work for me on Wednesday night and on Sunday night. Oh. And there's not make any changes after Wednesday night. <coughs> Control all delete, not even switching well, it off. Just... <laughs> anyway. George continued on his journey. He reached 30 miles, so he got his what called bronze thistle. <coughs> he then moved on from that to the silver. Sheila and her pal um, on the right. And you can see she was smiling as usual. Now she also told me a long time ago that it never rained on top of a horse. Riders never got wet. So I kept asking her why she go on and wait uh, when it's kind of cold. And you can see the ground's pretty wet. But it doesn't rain on the back of the horse. You can tell them. Now here she's coming along in a ride on her own. And this here is the water bottle. And she's telling me she needs more water. So she goes. And here's George. Having finished the ride, and again you can see some of the stuff that we have to use. There's a bucket with water in it, and there's a line of comfort bottles filled with water. We had a guy who did the dual trace, his wife did the dual trace. He worked on the bin lorry, so everybody was provided with comfort bottles. And the comfort bottles, what you do with the comfort bottles, you fill them with water, and the rider and you. During the ride, the horse gets water sloshed over his neck and over his back end, <coughs> just to cool him down. Um, and that happens on a regular basis. So being a crew, you have to sit with the rider and look at the ordnance survey map. And she's got a route marked out in blue, red, or whatever colour. And she's going to be there, 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 and there. And you have to find out which road just by looking at the map, you have to find out which road meets with the trail that she's on and your crew are there. So to crew, you need the sloshers, you need a bucket of water, you need a bucket with beet pulp in it and water, because on the ride is generally clean not going to be clean water. So the beet pulp the way. gets them to drink. There, she and someone else are being crewed and they're getting sloshers to slosh over the, uh, the horse. Mm -hmm. And you can see the great glorious crew. So, once they, uh, well, there we are, there's Sheila trotting up. Uh, and you can see George is enjoying it. She's setting off here in a ride and you can see George got his head turned because every time she gets on the horse, she gives him a bit of Cake. And here we went on a ride to a place called Kirklisten, which is in the borders, outskirts of Edinburgh. Now, we must have been going, I think we were going to do um, 30, 30 miles, but it was going to be a weekend. So, because it was a weekend, it was going to be hot, forecast was it, it was to be hot. And for a big horse like George, is bad news. So 
it's going to be hot, so we'll go to Tesco's and we'll buy a gazebo. So we bought a gazebo, and you can see <coughs> Sheila's friend Marion was taking it down. It didn't last there very long because it was kind of breezy there, so it blew away. Well, Dave. So there was people from Scotland who uh, didn't get a volunteer to provide a gazebo <coughs> last year at Schoon, but that was why. Um, that's Sheila again riding. And you can see she's enjoying it. George is in full flight, obviously, and he's enjoying it because the ears are well for all. <laughs> Kelso, 2005, um, Scottish Championships. Like everything else, we have National Fire Show, National Daily Show. Um, the Endurance Club have a national uh, uh, endurance championships once a year. So this year it's in Kelsey. There's also um, an, uh, an international championship where Scotland, England, Ireland and Wales and won two years Cornwall <coughs> because they were um, also within, contained within the international there's a Celtic challenge. So Cornwall, Cornwall said that they were Celts. So they came. Sheila and her pal Hazel. Now Hazel's horse, if you look at the difference between the two horses, Hazel's got an Arab. So Hazel um, vets with a heart rate of about 35 or 36 at the start and at the finish. Josh starts with a heart rate of about 44 and we have difficulty <coughs> getting it down to 48 mm. when he's finished. <coughs> However, we did. That's in Adiwo, one of the favourite rides. That's in Adiwo as well. This one here is the, is the day the day we went to do the 50. This is the day we went to do the 50. We're at a place in the borders called Oxford. You can see we're well organised because all the tops are the same colour. <laughs> <coughs> you can see at the back end there, behind my uh, arm, the five gallon container. Um, there's bananas, there's sloshers, there's water buckets, there's all kinds of things. Because when it comes in, uh, either at vetting, at the vetting or at half time, you have to cool them down. So there's sponges, there's water going, there's water going everywhere, and there's water going everywhere during the rain. So this was a 50 mile ride, and this was when he was going to get his gold. And the kind of ride it was, it was a race ride. And the reason that we entered the race ride was not to win it, but at a race ride, the heart rate, the final heart rate can be 64. So George finished on 61, which is why, as I say, we did the race ride. We've never gone down to 48. But during that ride, during that 50 miles, I poured 50, 70 gallons of water on yeah. during the ride and at the end of the time. And I'll tell you, I knew every cow trough <coughs> and every ditch and every barn between round the whole of the ride. And it was quite hard work. And that, again, is having more. Uh, and you enjoy having more. Here we have Scottish team. <coughs> First, <coughs> Sheila was the Scottish team a couple of times. First time was at Doors in Inverness and it rained all the time. So this one here, the guy with the flag was a team vet. George was getting his main platen because that helps to reduce the sweating. That's them standing at a parade on the day before the rain started. I think that's the leader of the pack of the flag. Sheila was doing pleasure right then. Just before we got into that, we've been, I don't know how many, how many towns, villages, hills we've covered with George. But we've been to Wales twice, to both Wales with the international team. We went to Ludlow Racecourse, again with the international team. We've been to Adimoor, Dundee, Inverurie, the Black Isle, 
all over Scotland uh, with the horse. And George's kind of finale, if you like, this uh, picture here shows a silver boot. Yeah. And there's a competition to win the silver boot. Now, to win the silver boot, um, or it was started, first of all, it was started by a guy who had a, a place in Scotland called, it was on the west coast somewhere, called Gary Gulloch. Good Scottish name. And he was a horse person. But I think the only way you could get there was by horse. Or that was the, the before, in foot cars, I think. So he, along with a few other people who were horse riders, they decided to have a competition. And the competition was to leave from somewhere and travel by horse to Gary Gould. Now, Sheila did this competition twice. First time, um, she did it with one other person. And, then, and she did it with the same person twice. The first time, she went from Appen, which is outside Wogan, across into Glencoe, and you got points for all some of the things that you did. You got points for a number of horses, you got points if you stayed in the same horse the whole time, you got points for the mileage, and you got points for the number of hill passes that you went through. <coughs> so she went from Appen to Glencoe, so there's a couple of hill passes there, and they have to be over a thousand feet. So she went to Glencoe, stayed overnight in Glencoe, then left, that was on the Sunday, left on the Sunday into uh, Glencoe. On the Monday, up the Devil's Staircase onto part of the West Highland Way and across then to Carrara railway station in the middle of nowhere, on the way to Glencoe. And we were stayed on the horses there overnight and staying there in the old signal box. Now Charlie here, he left Glencoe, went home to Teyalt, picked up half a bale of hay and a couple of horse rugs, and went to Crean Larry, which is the railway station, to get to Carrara. Went to Carrara with this half a bale of hay and the two horse rugs. Get off, this, get off the train and go 400 yards to a wee hut where there was an Argo uh, sitting and there was some space. The horses were going to be in a paddock there at night. So I left the hay there and I left the rugs there. And I'm standing against the fence eating a Snickers bar. And this place is, the, there's a youth hostel at the lower end of Wachossian, just 100 yards away from where I am. And it's pretty busy. So there's a bank. And from this bank appears a red deer, stag, and he's walking across the bit of road that's there, and I'm thinking, no lie. So he came right up to me, and I put a bit of Snickers bar in my hand, and he took the Snickers bar off my hand. And I thought, if you're coming in here, I'm going out there. And then he just walked away. <laughs> so he was obviously so used to people, because of the youth hostel, that people weren't a problem with him. So they went from, then they went from Carrara, we stayed in Carrara overnight, and in the old signal box, up in the top, there was a table with ordnance survey maps of the whole area that you could see. <coughs> so that was quite interesting. So they went from Carrara to a place called Trinifua, which is near Pitlochry, and stayed there overnight. I met them there, and then a Hightail the two in her nets to go on a, an advanced life support course because I was a nurse. So I was there for two days. They then went from Trinifour to near that in New York, King Yusey. And then from King Yusey to Braemar, and then from Braemar to Tommy Tool, the place that's always snowed in. So I finished the, the that was on, they arrived at Tommy Tool on the Friday. So I finished the ALS course on the Thursday. Went back to Tenault, picked up the horse box, and headed for Tommy Tool. So now you see why I had 250,000 miles in my car. <laughs> <laughs> so they won it that year. The next year, we went to, um, from a place called Conton, which is just outside Dingle. 
and we ended up, we went to, from Quantin to Shieldbridge, which is below the Five Sisters of Contero. So that gives you some idea of the kind of terrain that we were in. We went from there to Strong Ferry area. And then we went from, they, they went from there, I, I, I was following in a car, we went from there to some up to uh, Torridon, and then eventually back to Ponton. Now if this video works, which I doubt it. The these, are, these are just red deer, and these were in a, a, a glen called Glenstrath Parra, and they're wild deer. And to get to Glenstrath Parra, you have to get a key from a lodge house at the beginning of the glen. So, these deer were there, and that's going to happen. But I took a video of wild deer crossing the road, and just jumped down the road, and, and then there's a whole load of stags at the bottom. Move it on you. Right. Well, I'll move it there. Oh, there you are. That's Sheila at the end of the second week of riding. And you can see George is totally knackered. And she was absolutely delighted because it was horrendous. <laughs> this picture, I don't know if you can read it, but what it says, and this is for the person who volunteered me, what it says is about parking. Have you paid and displayed your parking fee? I'm not sure if that's ever been paid or not. <laughs> and whoever I'm talking about knows who it is. And that's, just, that's the last uh, ringneck ship that was built for Charles. Oh, well. Thanks for listening. I'm sorry about it.